Hello, so my name is Mel Leroux. I'm a PhD student at the University of Zurich and I'm working right now on the um, vocal communication of chimpanzees and specifically I'm interested in the evolution of language and I'm trying to, um, to investigate whether chimpanzees have something akin to syntax in humans. So I'm investigating call combinations in chimpanzees and I'm trying to yeah, check whether or not they follow the, some of the rules, some of the basic, very basic rules uh, that uh, human syntax follow as well. So welcome, Dr. LaRue. Thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. It's a, an honor to be here. To begin with, we'd like to ask you a little bit about the background science of your research. So what exactly is albinism and how does it affect animals in the wild? So uh, first of all, I, I just would like to say that I'm not an expert in, in albinism. And like I told you just now, I'm more focused on, on the evolution of language and so on. So I'm not like completely, yeah. I don't know any everything about about it, but from what I know is uh, albinism is the total uh, absence of pigmentation of melanin, uh, and it it is the results basically of recessive alleles that uh, uh, belong to different genes and that disrupt uh, uh, the melanin production and pigmentation, and so it has been hypothesized like it's it's still quite unclear where it comes from, but several factors have been associated with the occurrence of albinism. So it can be env environmental stress um, or uh, inbreeding, for example, uh, and so on. And so, yeah, that's, that's my understanding of albinism. So in your study, you mentioned how albinism is rare in vertebrates, especially in mammals. Uh, do you know why that is so? Well, so I would say that, you know, when, when one individual is uh, affected by albinism, this individual becomes mostly white and, you know, without any pigmentation. And that makes this individual uh, very conspicuous in, in, in its environment. And that alone uh, represents a lot of challenges for these individuals. So these conspicuous uh, states make them super vulnerable to predation. Uh, also, albinism is, is associated to um, um, some bodily defects, such as abnormal eye developments, um, uh, resulting in poor vision. Uh, we have also uh, a, re a reduced protection against sun, uh, ultraviolet um, uh, radiation, and so on. And so just those factors make albinism uh, and individuals with albinism very uh, um, subjected to, well, predation and, and all these factors, and which probably make them super rare because they, they cannot reach maturity um, as easily as other uh, conspecifics, for example. So I would say that that would be the first um, that would be one of the reasons why they are so rare. And the other one is obviously because having such mutation on all those recessive alleles, because, yeah, because albinism is, is, is genetics uh, and, and related to genetics, but not only to one allele, but several one, I guess having all the mutation at the same time is uh, something very rare also. Right. And so in your research, you and your team observed a group of chimpanzees known as the Sanso community. So can you describe this community and the environment that they live in? Yes, so it's in Uganda, uh, Eastern Africa. Um, it's, so they are in the Budongo forest. Um, this forest is like in the northwest of Uganda, close to Lake Albert, if I'm not mistaken. And so this is basically like a, a, a rainforest. Um, they have like a, 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 a territory of, I think, six kilometers square, six square kilometers. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, basically their environment is rainforest. So it's like a lot of massive fig trees and, and a lot of different trees. Very dense environment as well. Like the forest habitat is super dense. Um, and so this community evolves in this um, um, forest and it's like 72 individuals. Uh, that includes adults, uh, sub-adults, juveniles, infants, um, uh, males and females, uh, and yeah, that's that's it. What exactly did you observe in the chimpanzees that you monitored, and how did you conduct uh, such research? So uh, I, I I will start with the latter question. So we. What we usually do is just to follow the chimpanzees. So we enter in the forest at like seven uh, in the morning uh, and we come out around like half past four or five. And uh, and what we basically do, even like for every research basically, is just to follow the chimpanzees um, and we mm, record their behavior. So depending on the research we're doing, either we're um, audio recording or we do video recordings or just taking notes for example and in this uh, specific case we just um, I mean it's, it's like I said it's not my main um, area of research and it was very opportunistic basically and uh, just when we saw this individual we just I mean, we realized immediately that this was uh, super rare and super interesting. So um, as every researcher is around, we do have uh, video cameras. And so as soon as we saw this individual, we just uh, tried to get as much uh, observation as we could. So just taking notes and op trying to observe everything that was happening and, and when it was possible, uh, video record as well and as I told you like the the environment is super dense so sometimes it's not totally possible to actually have a um, a video recording but uh, in this case we could and and that's um, yeah that's what we did basically right and so could you describe the process by which you observed the chimpanzees for example what exactly happened between the chimpanzees uh, while your team was present, uh, you mean with the albino individual? The albino, the individual. Yes. Albinism. Yeah. Um, so the well, there there were different, like there were two different um, um, episodes. Let's call it this way. Uh, the first one was the first um, uh, introduction of this individual with albinism to the community, and the second episode was when the um, individual with albinism was uh, uh, introduced a second time to the community and this time was killed. And so the first um, um, the first episode where the individual was introduced in the first place but nothing happened to him, um, well, basically you just observed uh, chimpanzees interacting with the, the new infant and uh, it was actually very various like we had chimpanzees that didn't react at all to it uh, and that happened in normal situations as well and and you had chimpanzees reacting very strongly to it with very uh, specific behaviors like alarm calling and and um, uh, while barking so all those calls are, are associated to alarm uh, context alert situations so they were most of them, I would say, were fearful towards this uh, unusual individual at, uh, in the first place, even though not all of them. But that's, I mean, in a normal situation that can happen, what was uh, um, most uh, unusual was the magnitude of the, the, the behavior that chimpanzees exhibited towards this individual with albinism. And especially like the, the the strength of the fearful behaviors, like the, the alarm calling and so on. And so that would be the first episode, and then the second. Uh, and so basically, once the the mother was uh, um, seeing all those chimpanzees being afraid and so on, she uh, 
um, decided to go away and she disappeared in the thickets uh, under like super dense vegetation and she just got away um, like that. And uh, and so then I think four days later or so on something like that, she uh, came back to the main group of the community. And this is where the infanticide happened. And um, here, what we observed was, uh, well, initially we didn't observe anything. We actually only heard something because we only, like they were again in very dense vegetation, so we couldn't see them, but we heard screams and so on. And, and like a very typical tone of scream that would be an infant scream. So we knew that something was happening and that was involving an infant. And we also knew about this albino individual with albinism. So we, uh, we obviously thought that it might be related and it, indeed it was. Um, and so, we, yeah, I mean, after that, they just came out of the dense vegetation, the thickets and the, uh, and the alpha male uh, had possession, possession of the individual with albinism and, uh, and basically, yeah, he, he started started biting on it and uh, yeah, interacting with the with the the infant. Um, then he gave it to another uh, female, actually. Um, and all those time, all during all this time, the the chimpanzees surrounding the um, uh, the alpha male or the other chimpanzees that holding the infant. Uh, they were all very interested, like very curious about what was happening and what was this individual. And they were very curious, um, I would say. And um, yeah, so we just like, it was a quite a long time, like I think three hours or something uh, of just chimpanzees within the community interacting with the infant. At some point, this female that got the chimpanzee uh, by the head of the infant, which caused it, uh, its death, probably. Um, and, uh, and then they kept interacting with the body for, for quite a long time, like I said, like three hours or something. And, and they just rolled like one chimpanzee after the other, interacting for 10 minutes and, and, and yeah, going in this, like taking turns, basically. So was the infanticide um intentional or was it kind of unintentional um and it was an accident how the baby died um uh, it's super interesting it's also super difficult to answer this be just because uh we like in our field we struggle about the definition of intentionality i wouldn't call it accident though uh because it wasn't like like, yeah, I, I don't know if they intended to uh, commit uh, an infanticide, but the, the, it wasn't an accident. Like, yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, so I would, yeah, indeed, I would call it intentional, probably. Um, although one needs to be careful with what is the definition of intentionality, but um but yeah probably and um yeah i mean you know it's not a super unusual behavior actually especially in the somso community so the the this community uh, of chimpanzees like infanticides is something it's not happening every day but it's it's not something unheard of and and we are somehow kind of used to it like we we have several cases over the years of infanticide and myself during my time in, in Sunso, I, I also witnessed other infanticides in other conditions. Um, so, yeah. Do you happen to know the significance of biting the head of the infant or the significance of that behavior? Because it seems as if um, many of the chimpanzees did that to the infant. Uh, so I think biting the head, uh, only one really did so. Uh, only the female that actually uh, killed the the chimpanzee. The biting, I mean. Um, yeah. Uh, otherwise, the. 
the significance of this behavior specifically, I don't think there is any like uh, uh, mystic significance around this one. Like, I think it's just, you know, it's they're also biting fingers and biting toes and foot and hand, and I think it's 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 a, a mix of a, a, a curiosity and and you know trying to figure what what it is and 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 in some cases although i don't think it was the case here in some cases also just cannibalism basically eating feeding so clearly this um albino infant was seen as a completely new addition to the group that they haven't really seen before so do you think the interactions uh, between the other chimpanzees and the infant were more out of curiosity or fear? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I would say because of the, like I said, like because of the alarm calling and uh, the behavior they exhibited upon the, the initial uh, encounter, I would say it was more fear or more like unsettled. Like I'm not sure it's fear, and I think we would need more um, cases to really disentangle which emotion it was. Uh, but I think it, they definitely were unsettled, not just curious. It was unsettling for them, and they were. Uh, it was definitely an alarm situation. So. Chimpanzees can be uh, very aggressive towards unfamiliar animals or people. Um, how, how did your team manage to get close enough to the chimpanzees to observe them? Yeah, so uh, my team is like, when, when you look at the, at the paper we just published, it's like a lot of people. And actually, I'm... Uh, coming here in 2021 but uh, be, like the, the 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 study was 20, like the indi individual with albinism we saw uh, we saw him on 2020 2018 sorry uh but just yeah no sorry just to say that our team is basically a team that has began to observe those chimpanzees since like 40 years uh, and for example we like so yeah I think the first time a, a researcher came into this community was like 1960 and uh, and since then it was like uh, some presence all the time and especially from like 1990 it was everyday presence from researchers and that's what allowed us to really get into this level of proximity with the chimps that we would be able to actually observe them. So it really is a, it's, it's called habituation basically. It's, it really is a work of like a lot, a lot of time and over a very long period of time until the chimpanzees just don't react to us anymore and don't like, yeah, they just don't care about us anymore. And I, yeah, I need to say also that this, team and this work is not done by uh, just me and other researchers it's also by like an incredibly uh, dedicated team in Uganda with uh, local people uh, that work in the field station every day all year round uh, to check on the teams and to follow them and uh, and to keep this habituation going and it's really hard work uh, from a very huge amount of people um, that are really dedicated to that. And that's what allows us then to come and do research and observe those cases as well, like those very rare cases. So you mentioned that it's extremely difficult to get chimpanzees properly habituated to a certain human. So how long on average does it take to, for chimpanzees to be habituated? That's a very good question. Actually, I don't have the answer to this question. I don't know. I think there is um, uh, there must be research. I know that uh, 
uh, we have uh, so in the Sonso community is in the Budongo forest, and in the same uh, station that I'm working with, uh, we, I mean, we like the team in the station, not me personally, but the team in the station has started to habituate another community. I think ten years ago. Um, which is close by, basically a neighboring community. And uh, even after, I think it's at least 10 years now, uh, even after after 10 years, uh, they are habituated to humans' presence and, and, and they can conduct research and there's no problem. But the level of habituation, basically the level to which the teams don't care about human uh, just is not the same yet. So it takes at least 10 years, I would say. But again, I don't have like a strict answer to that. I don't really know, to be honest. So uh, you mentioned in a previous question how the community that you studied has a history of infanticide uh, between chimpanzees. So is this specific one with the albino infant a common practice? Uh, all, or sorry, is infanticide in general a common practice in all chimpanzee groups besides the one you studied? And if so, why may that be the case? Yeah, so it, so it is definitely. It's not uh, specific to the Sunso community. There, like in in the other community I just talked about, uh, in the same forest, it's they also have witnessed infanticides, uh, and it it's not only in eastern chimpanzees. There, as you know, like there is different subspecies of chimpanzees, and so in western chimpanzees as well, infanticides have been observed. So it's uh, it's something very um, uh, global in chimps. It's, that's that's a behavior that is uh, yeah well known. Um, I would say yeah it's so basically it could have happened no matter what. So even though the individual was uh, wouldn't like. Yeah, if he wasn't an uh, 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 an individual with albinism, he could still have been victim of infanticide. Um, and so, the for as for the hypothesis behind the behavior behind I, uh, infanticides, I think it's so. There is work done in this, and and there are at least three hypotheses that I know of uh, that could explain this behavior. And uh, I would yeah, I would just suggest to read. Uh, another paper, uh, which is by Adriana Lowe, L O W E, in 2019, and she did a survey on uh, infant sizes first in, in our community, and uh, and she and her colleagues, of course, uh, uh, try to yeah come up with uh, different hypotheses and 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 try to test them uh, with the data we have on infant sites in our community. And one of the hypotheses she and, and her colleagues specifically mentioned, and I really like, is that she basically, um, so yeah, the hypothesis um, says that basically if a hierarchy is quite unstable, so males fight with each other, for example, or there is like a, um, uh, a male that is ri rising super fast in the ranks, then it is likely that infanticide will happen in that community because, for example, the male that is rising super fast, then he will kill the infant right now so that because he's probably sure that he didn't, uh, uh, he, he wasn't the father of these infants, so he will kill them. And then because he's rising fast, he knows that the next time the female uh, is in estrus, he might be able to actually secure. The, the the fatherhood basically the yeah and and be the the, the the father of the infant so that's one main hypothesis I think it's um, brilliant and I I mean it totally makes sense to me so the infanticide of this albino infant seemed far less intentional um how was the infanticide of the albino albino chimpanzee different from other infanticides in the way that it was carried out so um <clears throat> so yeah as i said like in the beginning the, the the magnitude of the behavior exhibited towards the infants uh, uh, with albinism is is very different so yeah 
upon initial encounter, like the initial uh, uh, fearful behavior, alarm behavior uh, from the chimpanzees, this can happen uh, when encountering a new infant, but the way it happens with the infant with albinism was much more stronger. So I would say that was different. And then uh, I would say the other thing that was super striking to me um, and to m the team working with me was that uh, after the infanticide, the extent uh, with which every individual interacted with the body and inspected the corpse and uh, stroked the back of the hair uh, and pinched some hair and and even I mean, that's, that's uh, a bit more um, um, graphic, but they inserted uh, a, a finger into the anus of the individual, of the infant with albinism, after its death, quite repeatedly, and, and several individuals did that. And that is a behavior that we uh, very rarely observe before, only once, actually. And we have this uh, idea that actually it could be to help individuals to gain uh, olfactory information about this uh, individual that is unusual uh, with, it, with its appearance. So yeah, I would say the, yeah, the, the very careful and thorough inspection of the body afterwards, after the infanticide, I would say that is very um, different from uh, other infanticides especially like the, the focusing on the hair uh, of the body was also like striking to me. Right. And so what do you think specifically caused the chimpanzees to react violently to the albino infant now knowing uh, what we understand from previous chimpanzee infanticides and specifically the one with the albino infant? So was it something specifically to do with its condition or a similar cause to other infanticides it's so I, yeah i think we it's we need to be careful when we try to interpret these kind of things because we like it's only one case so to draw like firm conclusion about it we would need more cases and and so on but i would say so yeah, it's, it's really hard to tell whether or not the infant side would have happened no matter what. I think what's uh, clear is that, so I don't know if, if they killed it because it was uh, an individual with albinism or just because it was a new infant, but what's clear beyond doubt is that they perceived these chimpanzees as an unusual chimpanzees, like they, they clearly were unsettled by its appearance, basically. Uh, but, but I cannot tell that uh, it's because of its appearance that it, it got killed. That, that is, I cannot, yeah, uh, we, we don't know that for sure. So uh, in your study, you mentioned how certain, uh, certain individuals in the community um, treated the, the albino infant as just another member of of the community. Um, what do you think caused such a stark difference in the way that various individuals treated the infant? It's a good question. It's also a very hard one. Um, I would, I mean, it's, it's just a, an anecdote, uh, but funny enough, one of the individual that actually didn't react to it is also the eldest female. She's like 56, I think, or, or 57 years old. And one could imagine that maybe she just is more, even is either she, she has seen more or she's just yeah, true just chill about this kind of alarm situation more than the others. I, to be honest, I'm not sure. It's actually super interesting. Like if we could, but that's, yeah, I mean, that, that would be amazing if we could really understand 
why certain individuals didn't react at all to it and were chill about it and why others didn't, uh, that would be super interesting. I mean, that would be amazing. And also, like, can you imagine if everybody didn't react and we had, like, an adult chimpanzee with albinism? That would be crazy. That would be super cool. But, yeah. But, yeah, no, I cannot... I don't really know the answer to that. Is it possible that the, the reason why we haven't seen many chimpanzee uh, chimpanzees with albinism is because um, they may have been killed when they were babies. So it's very difficult for them. To... Yeah, so this is, I mean, of course, definitely. Uh, that, that could be a, a reason. Another reason is also the dense nature of their forest habitat. So just maybe we missed it um, uh, for some reason. Uh, Another yet an, another reason could be that just simply we did not uh, like there is a lot of chimpanzees community that are uh, uh, being followed by researchers and and are the the subject of research and so on but definitely not all of them so I mean it can happen elsewhere and um, something that is also important to note I think and to say is that. Our case here is the first that we report, but it might not be the first that we observe. And uh, that could totally be possible that uh, previously uh, uh, such a case was observed either by researchers or by local people even, uh, which is probably uh, like, to me it's likely that uh, local people could have observed it and, and uh, it wasn't just reported to uh, uh, like an international journal, uh, research journal. So, I mean, yeah, it, it maybe other people observed some, that's what I mean. Maybe that's not the first time we observe it. It's just the first time it's been reported. So did you find the, the individual with albinism by chance or were you specifically searching for um, an albino chimpanzee it was totally by chance like we were um, so we were expecting this female to be pregnant like we knew she was pregnant so we were expecting her to give birth soon uh, and so when it's uh, in, in these cases the vet team uh, in, in Budongo like they, they do like uh, an amazing job and they keep track of chimpanzees on like daily basis and so on and so when those um, uh, birth happen, they try to yeah monitor the chimpanzees to make sure like the infant is fine and so on. And um, so I think the fact that we saw the baby of this female is not a, a random uh, thing. The the but we didn't expect at all uh, uh, an individual with albinism. That's for sure. Yeah. And your study highlights that this was actually the very first documented albino chimpanzee infant yeah. uh, to ever have been actually documented by scientists. So the, was this something you guys knew? Oh, in the wild. Yeah. So we, well, we, we didn't know, like, I, I mean, so there is this other albino chimpanzees that was uh, documented, like, that we heard of called Pinky. And the thing is, like, um, this individual, so it's a female, and she was uh, taken from the wild very young and, and brought to a sanctuary. And, and she died there uh, some years later. And so, but even this wasn't really documented, written, and reported anywhere. And actually, we, we tried to look for, like, a report from behaviors, uh, from conspecific towards this pinky and we, we saw nothing. So I think, so that's why we say it's the first documented. Uh, but again, like it's, it might not be the, the first observed. Uh, and um, I mean, we, uh, to, if you asked me, I would have never said that I would have observed a, a, a chimpanzee with albinism in, in my life. <laughs> so it's quite cool. <laughs> 
So looking now a little bit more big picture in terms of your study, can scientists infer anything new about chimpanzee behavior and chimpanzee societies from the research documented in your study? So I think um, yes and no. And I will start with the no. The no just simply, again, because we need much more observation to draw any uh, robust conclusion from this one case. And so it, we do learn from it, uh, but we need to be super careful about what we say and, and how we interpret things. And I think maybe the, the strongest uh, conclusion we can draw from this study is definitely on the cognitive side of thing where we can say that chimpanzees perceived this individual as a conspecific with very unusual appearance. And, and they re like in our paper, we mentioned one hypothesis that um, in, in the Sunso community, they, they do prey upon uh, baby colobus monkeys, which are white. And, and our hypothesis is that maybe this individual uh, clashed with the appearance of a chimpanzees, but also with the prey image of this community, which is a baby white uh, primate, basically. And, uh, and so, yeah, cognitively, we could maybe infer that there was, uh, there were, yeah, unsettled and, and, and conflicted and, and they, they, they really perceived this uh, incongruence between what they usually uh, saw as a chimpanzees, as a conspecific, and this uh, individual with albinism. And I think that's, that's telling a lot already in terms of cognition, uh, but unfortunately, yeah, to draw any firm conclusion about like society, chimpanzees, um, chimpanzee society, then yeah, that, that would need more work for sure. So as you mentioned, albino animals and albino chimpanzees specifically are extremely rare to encounter. So do you feel like the fact that uh, this albino in chimpanzee that you encountered died in its infancy, do you feel like this may have been a missed opportunity to like study Albinism more, or yeah. what do you feel about? Yeah, of course. I was, I mean, uh, of like obviously we don't interfere in chimpanzees' lives there, of course. But I mean, it would have been great to to see a an, a chimpanzee with albinism just grow up and be part of the community and and study more the interaction between conspecifics and and this individual. That would have been amazing. For sure. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. LaRue. Those are basically all the questions that we had. It was an honor having you on the podcast. No problem. I'm, I'm glad you invited me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And good luck with your future research with chimpanzees and with your work in general. Thank you. Thank you. Keep in touch. <laughs>